is having proper data on what PPE is actually coming down to um, the Sussex area and how care homeowners and others can keep a track on where it is, where it's gone to, what's being used and, and what you can um, expect. And I entirely um, accept that it has been pretty uh, patchy and you need a much clearer idea of what you're going to get and uh, and when and you can try and make plans accordingly because it's a it's a bit of a uh, a jungle out there in trying to acquire PPE in the private uh, private sector. Um, in terms of other local provision, as Cheryl said about face visors, there was a firm in fact a few hundred yards away from Drum Kamala Home in Lansing who we've got to make a hundred thousand visors in the space of the last eight days. A firm called Parafix. Uh, who we then put in touch with the NHS. They completed that order this uh, this week. Now that's primarily gone to Western Sussex hospitals. I see no reason why there shouldn't be some capacity there for the care homes who need those visors to be able to latch into that as well. And there are various other local providers who've adapted their production lines to make some of that PPE kit um, as, uh, as well. Um, I've also been offered, and if, if anybody in my constituency is desperate for it, I've just been offered another thousand um, masks from a constituent whose business doesn't uh, yes, need please. them because they're closed at the, at the moment. If yes, anybody, please. Uh, right, yes, okay. please. If, if, any, if anybody needs them from my constituency, please send me an email uh, separately and I'll see what I can do. I'm due to pick them up um, uh, later, uh, later today. Um, but again, it shouldn't be relying on, on a, a windfall like, uh, like that. So certainly can I ask that people if you are really struggling to get this supply and you are not getting a, a response please feed that through to your local uh, MP because through all these different forums we can raise all these um, all these issues um, and finally I just say perhaps the uh, I mean, we're all trying to put out as much information as uh, as possible you obviously want information about PP about uh, health matters but also about employment matters um, too and the various business support schemes that the government has come up with uh, along with um, I'm sure most other MPs I've got a very large section on my website with all sorts of information on that that I'm guiding people um, to so please do use those uh, websites and let us know if there are still questions outstanding that haven't uh, come up uh, on that information so look that's just um just a sort of bit of background there are hotlines ar ar around pp which i'm sure you are aware of there's a 24 hour hotline for nhs and social care uh, providers can call it's the 0800 915 9964 number and there's a pp hub on the government's uh, coronavirus section uh, as well so again if you haven't got those details i'm sure isaac will distribute to uh, uh, those there are lots of places to go for, for for information but if you're still getting nowhere and you're getting nowhere the local authority and others then ultimately please come to uh, MPs and flag it up with us so that, those are the main things I just wanted to raise I'm um, if people want to raise questions later on I'm happy to try and take any of uh, uh, those but certainly I'll make a list of all the points that are coming up in the course of this conference and take those back to the relevant people we're speaking to in the next uh, few days Thank you very much, uh, Tim, uh, for joining us today. So I'm sure that the, while you were speaking, there were a lot of questions were coming through the chat and we were making a note of it. So we, we will get back to you if you can stay. Are you available? Oh, yeah, 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 fine. Thank you. Fantastic. And now over to NHS representative Re Rebecca Matthews, the senior manager of Essex County Council. Uh, maybe, Rebecca, you can explain to us about uh, testing and how it's rolled out. There were a lot of questions around that uh, at the chat. Please, is Rebecca around? Mm. Oh, part, yeah, just a view to myself then. Just to um, give some context, um, my job role, I'm program, program manager for care homes for West Sussex CCG, so I'm not, not that senior. Don't want to give anyone any false expectations that, <laughs> of what I can do. Um, in, in terms of, I think you asked specifically, was it about patient testing or staff testing? Staff testing. I believe. There's some comms coming out later today about exactly which will set out exactly how staff can book onto um, to have tests and there's going to be a central booking team who will be able to arrange those appointments and the, as, as has been um, already mentioned there's going to be sort of drive-through testing centres I think at um, Gatwick well known one also in Bognor and other places too so um, that should be the comms should be coming out today and I can make sure that's also sent to you so mm. that's, that would be useful 
Um, I was also going to give an update on a few of the things that we are doing at the CCG, um, which is probably sort of relevant to, to the current situation. Um, first of all, we're working closely with primary care, with some colleagues in GP practices, just to ensure that practices can offer extra support to their care host patients on weekends and bank holidays. This is where they've got capacity to do so. Um, there's been good uptake of this, I and mean, we've had some good feedback on where this has worked well over the Easter weekend. Um, obviously, still some gaps in this. We're working with primary care to ensure we can increase the service. Um, just wanted to really draw people's attention to community services, and um, specifically for West Sussex CCG. Um, in the north of the patch, we've still got our integrated response team who can continue to offer support at this time. And in the coastal West Sussex area, the community care homes matrons. And again, we're working with our community trust to make sure these services continue and how we might be able to expand them. Um, <coughs> NHS Mail, still looking to roll that out to all care homes. I believe across the South East is around half of all care homes have signed up to this now. And it's really important because it means that care homes can communicate patient identifiable information easily with um, NHS colleagues and primary care colleagues. So I would encourage people to do that if you can. And any, any problems, I mean, please let me know and we can escalate any issues to the national team. Um, also, Sussex wide, there is some virtual training being offered by the CCG's infection prevention and control teams. They're doing a running series of short virtual training courses each week. Mm. Um, I think it's over Skype, but I can make sure you have the details and details have been circulated by local authorities. Um, and these include things such as the sort of use of PPE, sort of hand hygiene, um, deteriorated patients and use of the Restore2 tool. And again, as I said, I can make sure you have details. That's just sort of a few things that I wanted to make sure that I mentioned on this call. Thank you, Rebecca. I think we'll have a load of questions to yeah. you mm -hmm. later on today. So uh, I already have a few questions already, but I will pass it on to, uh, we'll move on and okay. meet other people and then we'll get back to you. Uh, thank you very much, Rebecca. And uh, from West Sussex County Council, we have uh, Debbie Young uh, instead of Catherine Galvin. Are you are you around, Debbie? And can you hear us? Hi. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Debbie. Go okay, ahead. Thank please. you. Um, thank you for inviting me, and it's um, been really good to hear directly of some of the issues. Um, so I'd like to echo what you said at the beginning, Isaac, in terms of you know huge thanks to all care providers in terms of the you know, fantastic work they're doing in really challenging um, times. Um, and I think all of us that work, um, particularly in adult social care, um, feel very uncomfortable with the current situation. And what I mean by that is obviously, we work in this area because actually we want to ha help people to have a really good life and a really good end to their life. And I think um, certainly what we've seen and I know what's already been mentioned in terms of the divide between the NHS and social care. It doesn't feel like we're always able to do that. So certainly at the local authority, we recognise that emotional support is a real issue in terms of supporting providers and those care workers. Um, I know certainly at a national level, um, certainly in the document that was issued on Wednesday, um, it said that there's support for the NHS and um, consideration is being given to how this can be rolled out to social care providers. So I personally hope that happens really soon. Just to pick up on the PPE situation, um, exactly as we've heard in this call, it, it, it has been a really dire situation for social care providers. So certainly from West Sussex County Council's um, perspective, what we've tried to do is direct all um, inquiries for PPE through our contracts team. Um, so con contracts at westsussex.gov.uk, out of hours, it's for our out of hours team. So if someone happens to drop a note into that mailbox, you will see what the number is you need to contact. And I, you know, we are getting a phenomenal amount of um, inquiries. Obviously those do have to be prioritised. So um, you know, what that means is we need to gather information in terms of current stocks, how long those will last and what's needed. Um, because of course our, our stocks um, you know are finite also um, we do do drops from the county council to those providers that um, desperately need PPE and haven't got any deliveries on the horizon but we do accept that obviously this isn't the best situation to be in um, I know Rosemary mentioned um, payments to providers so earlier this week a letter went out to providers setting out the measures that we've put in place so far 
So that's not to say that's the final position because we recognise it does need to be reviewed um, because we do realise that providers are incurring additional costs, either new costs or differential costs um, due to the increase of some um, costs that they're having to meet. Um, I hear what's been said about the comms. So um, for the past four or five weeks um, in West Sussex, we've been putting out a daily newsletter to providers in sort of usual times, this goes out between once every four and six weeks. But as has been described, there's a phenomenal amount of information. We have tried as far as possible to um, summarise that. But as you can imagine, we're getting it as quickly as you are and want to get it out as soon as possible just to make sure the providers have got that. So certainly um, I would be interested from feedback, possibly through the West Sussex Forum, um, in terms of how we might still be able to to improve that, but it is a real balancing act between sharing information you might have um, and obviously, you know, ensuring that you do have it. So, like I said, we'd be really pleased to hear about that. Um, we want to offer support to providers. So, earlier in the week, um, we've taken the approach for providers that are in distress, um, i.e., have a you know reasonable number of um, confirmed or symptomatic cases and are struggling to cope. We are trying to do um, a coordinated approach across the council and health partners and by that what I mean is um, for now the care and business support team are contacting that provider and sort of talking through support that might be available to them and then what we do is that as we start we go back to our partners to indicate what support that might be so whether it's infection control whether it's specific guidance whether it's support they feel they need from their GP so we're trying to manage it that way um, and the reason for that is we appreciate that services are being really overwhelmed. So again, it's trying to get a balance between making sure you know that we are there, um, but not everybody contacting you for the same information. Um, also, we've put into place a joint placement team, so between ourselves and um, CCG, uh, which means that um, as far as possible, you should have limited contact by us trying to actually source capacity and then actually um, make referrals to your services. So um, that has been pulled together really, really quickly. So we've probably done something in the space of two weeks, which would normally take us um, six, 12 months to do. Um, I'm not saying that we're not agile, but as you know, um, public sector organisations do have a number of things they need to go through. So I can only apologise if you think some of the things that we are doing are slow. That's certainly not our intention. Um, you know, as far as possible, we are taking a light touch approach, but there are certain things that we still need to satisfy ourselves um, on. Um, we've also done quite a lot through our private care team again, supporting recruitment initiatives. So again, we'll be really interested to hear back from anyone in terms of how well that might be working. Um, you know, I'm not saying that we've got all of this right because we certainly haven't, and I think all of us over the past sort of month have been on a really um, steep learning curve and it's never our intention to put barriers in the way of providers and we genuinely do want to support so it'd be really interesting to sort of understand how we can do that so we did run a couple of providers forums two weeks ago which um, I believe um, well I think received some quite positive feedback and we'd like to run some more um, you know really like to thank you for the work that you've been doing not during the week uh, just during the week but out of hours and across weekends um, and picking up on the points that Tim Light and made earlier you know you have made a significant difference to the flow from the hospitals making sure that obviously people are in the best place possible for them our next challenge is actually moving those people on again so what might be long stay arrangements so um, you know again we really welcome the support that you're giving um, us with that we have um, heard what providers have said, so we have actually suspended some procurement. So some of you would have been involved in the domiciliary care procurement. We understand this takes actually a lot of resource from you. Um, and, you know, again, we agree that this isn't the right time to be focusing on that. So for the moment, we have actually suspended that. Um, happy to take any questions either sort of now or later in the meeting or, or, or followed up by Isaac or from West Sussex Partners in Care. Thank you, Debbie. I think there's lots of questions to ask you already. So we will move on with the rest of the speakers. And then uh, if you could stay along, uh, I'm sure all the questions yeah. that's relevant for you can be uh, directed to you. Is it all right? Okay. 
uh, thank you very much. I hope Debbie is going to stay, and then we uh, we can direct all those questions to Debbie. And now, now I yeah, have. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Debbie. And now I have uh, the executive director of Adult Social Care uh, from Brighton and Local Authority, uh, Hope Local Authority, Ron Percy. Are you around, Ron? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes. Okay, that's lovely. Thank you, Isaac. I'm going to try not to do too much repetition, but um, the bit everything's been discussed before. I was planning in my couple of minutes I've got before moving on, just to try and cover four areas and then possibly leave a, a couple of thoughts with you that we can discuss shortly, maybe. So firstly, I think it's really important to get across how important it is that everyone knows how much we value adult social care. I think when all this started, quite rightly, the NHS was being seen as getting a very, very high profile on how important our NHS workers are, and that's absolutely the case. But I think it's, it's important that social care should be seen as having a similar recognition. And I'd really like to thank MPs. I think through ADAS, the Association of Directors of Adult Social Services, there has been a degree of lobbying in the first few weeks about the importance of adult social care. So you'll see one thing which has changed, which was that for the first Thursday night, it was clapped for the NHS. You'll see that has now moved to clap for carers on a Thursday night. And I think there is a changing, there is a growing recognition amongst the media as well as to the role of social care. So I think I just want to get across how important social care is, how much we as directors of adult social care across Sussex really value the work that you do. I am speaking obviously just as the director of Finbright and the Hove, but I want you to know that I speak very closely with Keith, I'm a virtual Keith Hinckley in East Sussex every couple of days and with Catherine at the moment in West Sussex on a very regular basis. And ADAS across the South East, all the directors across the South East are having a weekly call to make sure that we can hear what's happening, try, try and make sure that we're supporting you as a care home provider market as well as possible. There's much more though still to be done. What I would like you to think of is in some of this kind of raising the profile of social care and trying to maintain that now, you know, when we do enter into recovery phase at some point in the future, what do we want to make sure that we can capture to take forward to try and make sure that we can improve the situation in the longer term? That possibly links me to my second point around the money. Listening to what Mike said earlier on and knowing that Graham Dean is, on the, uh, is listening to this as well. And Graham has written to me asking, what are we doing with the 8.1 million that's gone to Brighton and Hove? Um, so I can assure you, it is being in Brighton Hove. It is being spent. I will have a position whereby I will be able to write to Graham early part of next week to uh, to explain to him where that money is going. Contribution, domiciliary care, and a number of other areas within the adult social care market. It, but we are, you know, I think collectively across the southeast, we are spending very, very significant sums, and we need to be sure that we are accounting for that that money appropriately we're obviously spending a lot of money with nhs colleagues as well and so we are doing some really clear accounting because we to be honest with you the amounts we're spending are way in advance of the of the initial allocations being given to us and so we've got to be we've got to be aware of that situation um tim and a number of others have mentioned the um sussex resilience forum so just so you're aware that is not a that's not a body that stands alone that is a partnership of the blue light authorities across sussex on um, the two county councils uh Brighton city council and a range of other partners that come together to manage the overall response for the county to 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 this uh, to this pandemic um i i attend daily calls it meets every day now um and i attend those meetings on a daily basis we do do regular briefings to the mps and uh, as Tim mentioned earlier. Now then, on PPE, uh, just to let you know, uh, that we await the Clipper service, which you all have heard of. So as I understand it, the Clipper service, which is basically the provision of PPE to regulated providers, um, which was meant to start last week, for whatever reason, I'm afraid I do not know why, it is a frustration, I hear it, I'm totally with you, um, we have no control of it, but that is still some distance from being uh, from becoming to operation. So it is it depend on who you listen to. It is anything still between two to four weeks before that comes online. In that position, the are uh, the, the drops, and uh, again, it was referred to. There was a drop last weekend. Um, there will be a drop of PPE to Sussex again today. What is happening is that we're making the, these emergency drops. We're putting the orders in, and we will get another drop today. But I understand there has been a supply shortage of PPE um, nationally, 
And so that drop will not be as large as we had hoped it would be. Um, and unfortunately, until we get the drop, which will be at some point tonight, it comes into Lewis Police Station and then gets allocated on a proportionate basis to West Sussex, East Sussex and Brighton Hove. And we do not know until the drop arrives what the inventory is. So we can say we want 60, 100,000 aprons and 20,000 gloves. But until the drop comes, we won't know whether we get that or whether we get something different. Um, there's a lot of work going on across the counties and, and ourselves, though, to make sure that we get, we get greater clarity as to exactly what the demand is across all our providers. So we are, we are trying to coordinate the work for, for, all, our, for all of your, your care homes and the domiciliary care market, as well as any um, direct vision that we have ourselves and P, the PA market and carers and other areas as well. So th that is coming together and we, I would hope that we, by next week, we'll be in a position whereby we, can, we are ordering the quantities of PPE that we need to support the system. Whether we receive that PPE, I cannot, I can't tell, I don't have control over that. But I think the, the national drops I've alluded to are going to be the, our mechanism to continue to receive PPE over the coming weeks until the Clipper service is in place. Obviously, you still continue to, to run through your own procurement procedures, as indeed does uh, do the councils. So it's not in place of this additional two, but I just wanted to explain what, what the position is on PPE. On testing, um, I just be aware that local testing centres in, in Sussex, I believe, and I think Ash or some, I think there are people in the NHS who may be able to confirm this for me, but Gatwick opened last week, Gatwick North Terminal, recognise the problems that some people have if they don't have access to a car and driving there, etc. That's being run by Deloitte's, as is the Amex Centre in Brighton Hove, which will open on Monday. And then there are two other hub sites in Sussex, one at Bexhill and one at Bognor. They are both meant to be opening, uh, I believe, on Monday also. So that will increase the capacity um, for testing. I've heard really clearly about the communication today. And certainly, if you read the media a couple of weeks ago, you'll be aware of a care home in Brighton that um, had significant concerns about COVID in the care home. And what, we can't, what happened then afterwards was the manager then got inundated every day with, all the, with lots and lots of advice and lots of people coming in trying to help. The council, the CCG, NH, other NHS provider organisations, CQC, and almost there was an overload of information and then that meant that they, they couldn't distill exactly what they needed to hear, what they needed to take forward. And I just want to put forward a proposal. You'll be aware that there was some adult social care action plan was issued the other, the other day, or I think it was last night or the night before. And in that, it's got a little case study of Hereford, Hereford I believe, where they've established a provider hub, which basically is a single point of contact where any provider can, can raise the questions and, and an issue. And in that hub, I've not got the details of how it's organised, but I would anticipate it wouldn't take that much to get one established in some way, shape or form as a virtual hub, which then triages that piece of information and then gets the, gets, gets the relevant agency to provide the response. Because we do need to get much clearer as to exactly what the situation is with PPE, as to who should wear what, in what circumstance, at what time. Um, and I think if we could get one message out to, P to every provider, that they could all understand and we could all agree to, then that would be much easier. So I just put, pose that as a question as to whether you think there'd be any value in that. And then just one final thing, just looking at some of the comments on the right-hand side coming through. I think Tim mentioned sir, something earlier on today about the fact there's significant capacity in the hospital um, across, the, across the system and whether there should be, whether there's a view as to people with COVID positive or being symptomatic should all be in a hospital setting or not. I think that's something which is worthy of some discussion. As a DAS, I'm not giving a view on that directly. I'm not giving a position. I think, but I would be interested in your views on that. I don't think nationally is something we could potentially push through at all. But I'm just interested in locally your views. Obviously, one thing linked to that is one of the concerns that a lot of elderly, and elderly people have in going to hospital, which is absolutely incorrect, but I completely understand their concern, is some media coverage suggesting that the NHS was going to do some kind of prioritisation and not treat people um, over a certain age in hospital. That is totally incorrect and that, that does need to be addressed. 
But I think that's probably one of the concerns why people, when they're asked if they would go to hospital, said, said they prefer not to. Um, I'll just leave it there. There's so much more, but um, I've probably had my time. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Rob, uh, for summarizing what you have been doing. And we will have questions directed towards you as well. So currently we are sectioning all the questions uh, directed to different people. So th please stay with us. Are, are you available to stay with us? Rob? Sorry, yes, I, yes, I am. I, okay. I Fantastic, great. Uh, and now on to Karen Stevens from Skills for Care. Karen, are you around? Thanks, Hi, Karen. Isaac. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Karen. Thanks, Thanks. very much. Um, just wanted to highlight a few things. There's a lot happening, and I, but I wanted to keep it pertinent to the issues that people are raising here. Um, we have started with the support of national, um, the NHS England and Public Health England, um, a community of practice for infection prevention and control leads. That includes WhatsApp contact and regular webinars picking up the issues that are emerging through the WhatsApp contact. So if, you, if people want to get, excuse me, to get involved in that, then by all means, email me and, I'll, and uh, we'll get details to those people. It's trying to cut through so much of the guidance to actual practice um, and people are struggling with that as I hear. Um, we have also converted our registered manager forums to WhatsApp to keep feedback going around and about through registered managers. And we also have Facebook access, keeping that contact virtual. Behind that, we're also feeding a lot of that information into the Department of Health and Social Care as themes emerge. So we are able to escalate concerns directly for, about the workforce and issues raised to us, which is a good position to be in. And also, we saw features of your concerns very much highlighted in the social care action plan that's emerged quite recently. We've aligned all our materials um, into COVID information, related information that's very quickly on our website. And all the time we're releasing via our e-news weekly updates related to resources and guidance to help people. In terms of recruitment, um, we have weekly meetings with the sector representation from tourism, leisure, airlines, um, and all those um, areas that might have a number of people furlough, a number of people self-employed, and we are making links to how we can recruit them into social care or opportunities for volunteering into social care. And, um, as we make those links, what I'm trying to do is make sure we get that local linkage into national work. The other thing, next week you'll see much more information about the national recruitment campaign and what we're doing to really boost the promotion of adult social carers options, then how to make that national recruitment into local placement of people that come through. And we're working with the Prince's Trust to offer pre-employment opportunities and programmes of work for those people who are not ready yet to move into social care jobs. So they can access a lot of the care certificate background and the readiness for work approaches. Um, Cheryl, I was very mindful of what you said about registered nurses. I believe that's, that's what you are focusing on, the regulated workforce. So, uh, so a call out for, from me is we're meeting with the regional response hubs who are taking the redeployment numbers from the NHS call and saying, how can people move into social care? So we already have a number of people who are saying, as registered nurses returning, I would be willing and able to work in social care. What we need to do is make local links with employers and with people that can support that move as people who are returning to, as registered nurses and other practitioners uh, can access into social care. So I'd really like 
a conversation with the likes of Cheryl and perhaps Rebecca Matthews, the support uh, we can offer to actually get registered nurses to move into our sector from the offer being made by, by the regional hubs. So at some point, I'd really like a, an offline conversation about that and how we can support it. And then you will have seen that um, we are doing and made offer via health and social care funding, Department of Health and Social Care funding, fully funded online training covering volunteer induction, um, fast track for care certificate type induction, redeployment induction and mandatory training online virtual and that is fully funded and that is, is under our essential training section of our website. And our hope is that by activity to encourage promotion into paid and unpaid work in the sector, then virtual induction and at some point mentoring to help employers bring people online, as well as looking at specifics around how can we support registered managers and others as they uh, look at what they need to do around their practice on, uh, with CV-19 issues. So I'll leave it at that and very happy to take uh, questions when able. Thank you so much, Karen, for the update. Uh, the, uh, I think without uh, much delay, I think there's a lot of, uh, of uh, frustrating questions coming up in the chat. So uh, I think that should be the priority for all of us. Uh, yes, fantastic that uh, it needs to be recognized. Uh, our work needs to be recognized. We need to get claps. Uh, that's all fantastic. But I think there are more real issues which needs to be addressed. So over to Dr. Tom Jameson. Uh, if you can lead on the questions and direct towards the right person, that would be great, Dr. Tom. Can Hi, Isaac. Um, I'm happy to, to try and lead on the questions, although I suspect I might be uh, um, asking the same ones that are being asked, but uh, I'm happy to take any or direct any questions that come in. We have sent you an email as well. Okay, an email or a text? Uh, email. Okay. Sorry to put you on spot. That's no problem. Who's the email come from? Uh, it's from Jan. Uh, unless it's in my spam, it's not there. I've got one on a text um, that's come, looks like from you, okay. saying, um, can residents be taken into hospital? Um, so, so um, I mean, that's already been partly addressed. Um, uh, but, but I think the question is if, if people are suspected or known to have coronavirus in a care home, is there any scope that some of the empty beds in hospitals could be used to isolate those residents away from the other healthy residents in the care home? Um, I don't know who is best to address that really. Anybody from the CCGs? Rebecca? Uh, hello, it's Ashley Scarf. Can I come in on this one? Yes, please. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hello, I'm, I'm Ashley Scarf. I'm from the CCGs uh, covering East Sussex and Brighton and Hove. Uh, I think it's a, it's a really important question. And just to go back to some of the points that Rob was helpfully describing earlier. Uh, capacity across our whole system is something that we are, as you would expect, monitoring extremely closely on a daily basis. The priority, as I'm sure everybody would understand from pretty much the outset of this, has been looking to ensure we've got the capacity we believe we needed to uh, safely and most effectively accommodate the anticipated surge in demand for critically ill patients requiring ventilation, uh, critical care and intensive care type support. Uh, as we are beginning to see the impacts of uh, the social distancing and lockdown measures in place across the country, the of demand is starting to come through and be updated. Uh, which together with the available capacity and the absolutely value the contribution that everyone has played 
ensuring that capacity is there as we go through on a day by day basis, looking to see how we can best use all available capacity. Uh, it's certainly at the forefront of what we want to do. As Rob says, uh, or said rather, uh, in terms of you know, the national direction and provisions on this, we're very much in the phase of ensuring we can first and foremost respond to an, an expected peak that is yet to come. Uh, but beyond that, certainly we want to be making sure we use all capacity as best we can. Um, and I'm sure we will uh, come back to this again and again as we go through the coming days. Thank you, Scarf. I've, I've got a, a quote in front of me from um, a consultant who works in a West hospital um, saying that the hospital is practically empty and we are so overstaffed. Lots of milling around just looking for jobs. We are all waiting for the surge, but it's not coming. Um, and, and I think for social care providers to hear that kind of comment, we, we are absolutely worked to the bone at the moment, is, is quite frustrating. And I kind of feel that, that um, uh, the government's put way too much. Well, not, there's been great focus on hospitals, which I completely get the importance of. I just think that the, the focus on, on um, social care has, has started to come now, but it's, it's, it's a month too late. I don't know whether perhaps Tim Lawton could, could comment on that. Tim, can you hear us? Thanks. Can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. Okay, I, I think that's a I think it's a fair point. I think it's a point that I made um, earlier that all the focus on on PPE, on ventilators, on uh, all the resources has obviously gone into the hospital and freeing up that capacity and providing additional capacity and getting volunteers and getting people coming back from retirement and things like uh, things like that. Um, so I think that has been handled well. But there hasn't been an equal emphasis on social uh, care, which is why we're now seeing in the last few days the fact that a lot of care homes are under a huge amount of um, pressure. So, um, yeah, I, I agree. It should have been, I think, taken up rather, rather earlier. And we've now got to play um, catch up. Um, so that makes it really, really important that the PP and all the equipment and perhaps refocusing and this idea of some of the volunteers that somebody mentioned earlier, whether some of those could be diverted to uh, care home uh, environments uh, as well, um, I think is a good one, and I will certainly take that take that further. Thank you, Tim. Um, I'm just looking at some of the questions. I have received the email now, um, Isaac. So uh, I've got some. We'd like some clarity on what measures should be taken if we have a staff member go into isolation due to symptoms, yet was in the home giving direct care recently. Um, I mean, from from my perspective on that, um, I don't think there are any particular measures that can be taken. If, if I think it was Paul Mayer, I think, asking that question. Um, Paul, can you unmute? Paul Mayer. Hello. Tom. Hi, Paul. Hi. Hi. Yeah, no, so, I was in a because I, saw I had a member of staff who um, who was in, in in one of our homes uh, the day before yesterday, um, and then yesterday informed that he's now symptomatic and is isolating, but has, has spent the last fourteen days giving direct care to pretty much all of our service users in that home. Yeah, I mean, um, I don't know whether anybody's more qualified than me on this one or not, but my understanding now from the medical science is that they don't think that people are likely to transmit infection very much before they become symptomatic. I think there's about a 12 hour window, so I've heard that, that uh, um, uh, people may be infectious before they become symptomatic. Um, so, um, and, and the, the practical answer to your question is, I don't think there's much you can do. As you say, if, if uh, um, he's been in the home, uh, people may have been exposed. You, I presume you're, you're checking your, your residents um, a couple of times a day, at least anyway. Um, and, and that's probably all you can do, really. Yeah, no, we're, do, we're doing the temperature checks on residents and obviously asking them if they feel OK. And so far, yeah. that's what everyone's been OK. Um, and we, we've, we've got the rest of the staff in and done a, a deep clean of the service. Um, and I've just said to our, our, our managers, just inform the local duty team that this is a concern we have just to sort of preempt, you know, potentially 
in, in sort of two weeks time, we, we could have a, an outbreak in service and the, the sooner we get the information out, the sooner we can work with local authorities as to what can be done about it. Yeah, okay. Um, uh, I'm, I'm gonna move on to another question. If staff can only work so many hours because of carer's allowance, are they allowed to work more hours without getting penalised? That's Alana Elkin. Um, Alana, are you able to unmute? Hi, yeah, yeah. Hi there. Um, I, I don't know, again, it's a tricky one. Um, uh, we, we, pure, uh, the, 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 um, the, I can't remember the name of the company now, the HR advisors. Who am I looking for, Isaac? Oh, Jody, yeah. hello from Bevan. Jody, hi. Thank you. Um, I mean, it, it's it's more of a sort of HR workforce question as opposed to a sort of legal issue. So it, it's about the taxation point and whether or not the threshold is is reached in terms of any additional earnings. So I think the the individual will need to check probably with HMRC or payroll directly. Um, we we don't know whether there's going to be any exemptions applied or discretion applied by HMRC um, so, so it doesn't give you it doesn't give you an answer I'm happy to sort of make some inquiries and come back to you if that if that would assist so if we can take that offline I think that's probably the best way um, that'd be lovely thank you take, take that forward if you can give Isaac your, your details yeah lovely thanks very much thank you Judy. Thanks, Jody. Um, I've got two questions from Emma Carmichael. Um, the first one is um, a question about testing residents. Um, I keep asking for testing, but it's being told it's been handed from PHE to the CCG, um, but I can't get an answer when our symptomatic residents can be tested. Um, I don't know if that's a SCARP or a Rebecca question. Hello, so, <clears throat> hello Tom, it's Ashley Scarf again on this one. Um, absolutely recognise this one. There, there's been some there's been some guidance that came out uh, yesterday, or I think it was the the fifteenth, um, through to local authorities on this that we're um, working through. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if um, Debbie or Rob are able to expand on that more at this point, or whether that's still being work through as to what that means in practical terms. So this is Rob, Rob Percy, Darrington, Brad and Hope. Can I suggest on that one, just so that I don't add to the confusion and not giving a, a totally accurate message, there's something where I think our Director of Public Health could be pulled together to across um, Sussex and the counties and Brad and Hope to actually take some, to give some really clear answers back to you on this issue particularly. And just whilst I'm on, the other one I just think would be interesting, Isaac, if you arrange another of these meetings to have the uh, Director of Public Health representative would be quite useful, as well as giving an overview for the modelling of, mm -hmm. of COVID-19 across the county, because there has just recently been some guide, uh, some revised modelling, which is being, currently being pushed through, which can, will give us a strong indication of the demand. As we start to move towards the peak, we're anticipating that the peak will be flatter than originally projected, but we'll go for a little bit longer. And the model, as I understand it, suggests that will start in about a week's time. And so I think it'd be useful for, for colleagues here to just understand what that modeling is showing us from a point of view of critical care beds in hospital, from the demand for adult social care, and then for, from a cell that I'm chairing across the county around on sort of XF deaths or, or death management that we're looking at the moment. But I think that may help to give some clarity for you and also then we can within that address specific issues about exactly the testing when you get tested how you get tested it can they come into the care homes do they not who's going to be responsible for that etc so i just think that possibly that might be a way forward to get one single clear answer thank you rob i mean i, th I think that it, it's, it's an imperative question really isn't it because we're all hearing now that testing is being rolled out to social care um but i think the experience from from this webinar is is that uh, um, it's still a very confused situation and one that needs to be clarified very quickly. Um, Emma also had a second good question, which is, um, can we clarify the guidance about PPE? 
I know this has been mentioned already, but um, uh, the government has issued the various, or Public Health England has issued the various tables. Table two was relevant to care homes. I'm sure you're all familiar with what I'm talking about, but now it's a question of whether we should move on to table four because we have sustained transmission, I believe. Um, my understanding on this is that we technically, they have announced sustained transmission, therefore we should be working with which means consistently using masks, aprons for all resident and dog care clients. Um, I don't know, again, who, who would be the best person to, to give us any feedback on that. So shall, I'll go, this is Rob again, I'll go, I'll go on that. So my view and Brian Hove, where we are both commissioner and a provider of services, I'm actually missing a meeting with the unions at the moment to have this, this webinar with yourselves. But my clear message to our staff who are directly providing um, in a care home type environment um, is that they should all wear the equipment, gloves, gloves, masks, aprons, um, if they are delivering care within two meters, as the vast majority will be doing. Mm. And we are ensuring that we have PPE to support that and our, care and our other providers. From an employer's point of view, I'm quite clear that we would like to be able to provide more equipment than that if people wanted to wear more that made them feel safe. So goggles and mar uh, goggles, for example, if, if that was if that would help the staff member feel safer, that would be an ideal situation. But if it's not the minimum requirement, I'm not going to push out at the moment. What I will be clear on from my staff responsibility is I'm not going to put any staff member into a position whereby they have to treat any 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 service user or patient without that minimum PP according to the public health and the guidance. So that, so that's my position. I think that's what we need to be kind of really being clear on. The minimum standards, there are national guidelines that we've got to make sure we, we adhere to. If there isn't the equipment to support that, then you've got to look at what the alternatives are. And you know, realistically, one of those alternatives may be if you can't keep them in there, if they can't be looked after in the home, then the obvious place they're gonna to have to go to is the hospital, which is maybe not where you'd want them to go. But I think you've got to be looking at it in that context. Does that make sense? It does, thank you, Rob. I, I think the other interesting point on this is that in hospitals um, where they are treating people who are dying from coronavirus, they are then wearing gowns and FFP3 respirators as well. Um, and it does seem a concern to me that there are care homes, certainly around the country, I must say I don't personally know of any, but I know they exist where, where they have got people with coronavirus we've all seen it on the news but they're still just wearing the same water resistant surgical masks and and, and plastic aprons that, that we all are trying to get access to and i would have thought that where there is a very real suspicion or, or, or confirmation of, of covid in, a, in a, a resident in a care home that that provision should be made to get them the same level of PPE that they are using in the, in the uh, um, higher risk areas in the hospital. Uh, that's a message to Tim Loughton again, really Tim, um, for you to bear with the powers, I guess. Um, I'll move on to the next question, Helen from Cardinal Care. Um, is anyone having any luck with testing on COVID? So we have mentioned this already. Oh, and then you had a bad experience. Uh, Helen, do you want to just mention that? with your care of being turned away from Gatwick. Are you still there, Helen? I saw you online earlier. Oh, I can see you, but you're muted. How do I... Um... There we go, we've got you. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, literally, uh, through our CQC referral, we sent one of our carers, she drove all the way to Gatwick, um, got there and literally an hour ago and they said they're not doing them there she needs to drive to Chessington she didn't feel well enough so she's now driven home so we're now re-referring to try and get her tested but she does sound quite poorly she thinks it's a chest infection but obviously we want to get her tested um, so I just wondered if anyone actually has been to any of the testing sites and been tested Sorry, this is Rob again. Can I just ask, without getting into individual circumstances, did you get it? Did you notify of the test to Gatwick last night, or did she just drive there this morning? No, no, we, we sent her registration. We did it through our CQC referral, so we, it was yesterday. Um, okay, I, 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 so again, without getting into individuals, 
it'd be interesting to hear a bit more. I'm not sure that is the county because I've got contacts in Deloitte who I would refer those kind of cases to and ask for a, ask for a clarification as to why that why that yeah. and then being asked to drive to Chesterton if you've been accepted through the registration process. So without going through those details, I'd prefer, I would welcome Helen if you wanted to email me through Isaac or, or somebody. I would look into that just as a general point to check as to when people are registered that they do actually get to the testing centre and are treated. Okay. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Helen and Rob. Um, next question is from Rebecca Whitmore, um, again regarding CQC testing, uh, CQC, um, coronavirus testing, um, and Rebecca was commenting that she hasn't received an email from CQC yet and has been informed they're going out in batches. Rebecca asks anybody else has not received their email yet, um, and certainly I haven't. Uh, those who are on video, I don't know if you can just put a raise a hand to say if you have not received your CQC, or yeah, that's even better. <laughs> so I haven't, Michael hasn't, yeah, so, so lots of people haven't, um, some have. Uh, so um, uh, I guess that's something that they're going to be out rapidly over the next few days. Um, uh, Naz is asking how do staff who don't drive or have access to a car get tested? Um, Rob again do you have a response to that? Well in response I'm only giving a personal view so um, so please don't take this with a professional hat. So I think that's been a challenge for Gatwick particularly obviously. Um, so the immediate answer would be, is there anybody that has, has, can share a car or, or can, a way to get access to a car? I think it will hopefully get easier with the opening in, and so I see someone mentioned that Bexhill is already open, with the opening of more local testing sites, so the Amex opens on Monday, as I've said, and Bognor. Um, and just, you know, from a council point of view, we look, we, you know, informally, we're looking at volunteer transport to help transport people there. Um, and so, the, but there's no specific, I, I don't have a specific answer. Without wishing to sound too um, selfish, for want of a better word, I'm not sure how keen I would be on driving a long distance in a car with somebody to, who is suspected of having coronavirus to have them tested. Um, because I would have thought spending half an hour or an hour in a, in a box with somebody who potentially has the virus would be a bad idea but um no i'd agree with you on that i wasn't i wasn't trying to suggest that i'm just trying to suggest that you just i think that i don't really have a full answer to that to be honest with you i mean i think the local testing centers will help when they're, when yeah. they're running um, I've, I've actually got a more practical response to that as well sorry rob i didn't mean to be quite so negative um my wife is a gp and i know that their medical center has been issued with tests um uh, and they are going to be able to go out to people's homes and test them so uh, that may be another route for for symptomatic staff to get tested. Well hi um, Rebecca from West Sussex just going to say as well that um, I have been told as well that there's going to be a small amount of home testing available so just backing up what you said. So. Yeah thanks Rebecca. I'll get some more details on that. Um, a question from Yvonne to I think it's to Debbie Young. Uh, Oh, only some were able to join the last West Sussex online um, meeting. Will the next one be open to all? Okay, um, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Good. Um, so yeah, the reason for that was purely technology. Um, so I'm embarrassed to say that our Skype at the time could only take 55 O callers. That had been increased to 75. Um, so we do need to think about how we can actually open them to a larger audience. So it's purely technology. So I'm dialing in today purely because I can't get Zoom because, as Rob said, in terms of IT security, um, from a county council perspective, it's just not supported. So we will look into how we can increase that. And it may be as simple as just having to have more forums rather than more people actually on the line. So I can only apologise, um, but hope that the information that we sent out in the newsletter towards the end of last week, providers managed to see, um, so at least they can understand some of the questions that were raised and the presentations that were made following that. Debbie, can, can Skype um, webinars be recorded? Um, I don't know, but I can certainly find that out to Tom. 
um, because I know I, I can see on my screen that this one's being recorded today and I know that Isaac made the last one available for people to do yeah. access subsequently and that would actually be the most useful thing really um, because you know lots of people might not be available right now to, to yeah. join the meeting but might be able to to click on a link. Mm -hmm. well, I'll okay, well, certainly I'll suggest that for the next meeting. Yeah, I mean I'm happy to roll this out to everyone because I don't have a capacity limit I'm uh, I, uh, I'm already paying for this anyway. So if you want to use this platform to have a session, I'm more than happy to host it. And uh, yeah. There you go. Good offer, Isaac. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my bill too, sorry. Uh, da, da, da. So Ella asking a question for Rob. Um, uh, we've been pursuing Clipper, but they're telling us only drop to NHS trusts. Um, not social care. How would social care know and access these drop-offs you're referring to? Uh, Rob, I think you've probably already covered Clipper as far as you can, but did you want to add in? Yeah, just say, you know, I, I'm as frustrated as anybody on, the, on what we're hearing about Clipper, as is the SCG. So just to give you assurance that the Sussex Resilience Group Forum uh, is pushing this meets every day and what we do is we are we actually have the Ministry of Housing Community Local Government on that call as well and with that gets pushed up to the Secretary of State on a daily basis any messages from there and this is one of our biggest concerns about Clipper and not understanding why the delays and when it's going to come online but for absolute sure I think I put a note saying I will go away and just check this but Clipper as far as I'm aware is not just for the NHS, it is for all regulated providers. And I'm aware in Brighton Hope there has been some issue with being told that registration is now closed to Clipper. I need to just re I need to go back and check on that as to what the position is. As, but so I will come back to this, this forum and to address that and to address that with you. I can't Rob. already. But can I just use that? Because I'm gonna have to go to me. Can I just throw one question in Tom, Tom maybe just for the future? For the, yeah. I'm interested in how, in the care homes, whether you have any particular challenges with looking after some of your residents with, if they have to, with, with dementia, as far as moving around and keeping socially distanced, et cetera, and, what, and if any behavior challenges when they see people in PP equipment. It's just some feedback I've had that some people with dementia get quite frightened by that, and also the challenge for staff in the social distancing when dementia people start to wander. I'm sure that is the case. Uh, I don't know whether anybody uh, on the webinar today can can give examples. Um, hello, my name is Saza Juri, I'm manager at Park UK Home. I can give some example with regard to that. Um, yesterday we were involved in the Matlets webinar and um, um, organised by Nikki Still, and there were reports about people with dementia who have had to be locked in their bedroom um, because they were still wondering. Okay, Th thank you, Azar. Um, and anybody else have, have similar examples? Oh, I think uh, 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 down. I just wanted to add that this is also going to be a big issue for a lot of people with learning disabilities who um, maybe have communication difficulties and rely on seeing people's facial expressions and will really be confused and find it difficult to communicate with people with facial masks. So just to put that in there, thank you. Thanks, Ella. I've, I've got a barking dog behind me, so if that's causing too much noise, um, let me know and I'll do something about it. Um, uh, the last couple of questions I've got on the email are um, uh, one asking about whether we're supposed to be using face masks as per table four, which was an earlier question, uh, and also from Rosemary, how many care homes in West Sussex have residents with coronavirus at the moment? Um, I don't know. I, um, uh, I think I saw Paul answering that question earlier. Paul Mayer? Hi, Tom. Yeah, no, I did. I mean, we're fortunate for, for our West Sussex services. We don't actually have anyone at the moment who's who's in isolation due to symptoms, um, which is good. I mean, we're, we're quite a large company and we've had some in Hampshire and some in our Ipswich services um, where we've had some confirmed cases and even a couple that have passed away. Um, but West Sussex, fingers crossed at the moment, seems to be quite clear. Okay. 
But that's just in your service pool, yeah? Yeah, as I say, I mean, we, our services go all the way from Plymouth and, and up to, to Ipswich, but the, the West Sussex patch at the moment has, has been has been okay. We've got some staff in isolation, but no mm. service users in isolation due to symptoms at the moment. Okay. Um, is anybody able to answer that question on behalf of all West Sussex care providers? Rebecca, do you have any? So, so yeah, and um, so, um, so there are data reports that um, come in from Public Health England, um, which um, share information or start to share information recently on confirmed cases. Um, so for um, so this is cases rather than number of services within care homes. Um, so yesterday there was a cumulative number of 69 confirmed cases, um, at five of which were in the last 24 hours. But obviously what that doesn't say is the number, the number of establishments, um, but certainly from um, information that we've seen, it's into the tens. So um, we haven't sort of passed, uh, to, to my knowledge, sort of the number of 100 yet, but certainly I think it's up with a 30. And Debbie, in terms of confirmed cases, I presume by that you mean those that have tested positive? Yeah, so that's through PHE confirmed. So um, on a personal level, I have a bit of an issue with data, not PHE data, but of course, of you know, the sources of data. So certainly um, my viewpoint is I only take the information from PHE. And as you know, up until the announcement on Wednesday, um, only up to five people were being tested in each care home. And if any of those returned a positive um, result, then no further tests were actually made within the home. So, you know, in some homes, we've got 20 plus people with symptoms. So a number of those may be confirmed, but certainly up until the announcement on Wednesday, um, not all of them were being tested. And that's obviously been a bit of an issue. Yeah, I was, I was gonna say the same thing really, that. that um, and, and it's an interesting one in terms of the accuracy of the test. Um, uh, the, the terminology is sensitivity and specificity, um, and they score about 70% on both, is my understanding, which means that uh, about 30% of, of um, uh, positive results will be incorrect and about 30% of negative results will be incorrect. So I can, in a way, I can understand why they didn't test every single person in a care home. Once they've confirmed coronavirus is there, then anybody who's symptomatic could certainly be treated as, as having the coronavirus, because even if they then go on to have a negative test, there's a, a three in 10 chance that that's a false negative result, as I understand it. I don't know whether, again, anybody else has any different information on that. Yeah, we haven't really got any any sort of current medical people on the line, have we? But uh, it'd be interesting to get a viewpoint on that. Um, I know that lots more questions have come in on the group chat while I've been reading the email question. Um, uh, Isaac or or Jan or you know, do you do you want to either support me or do you have any that you want to go through, Isaac? Uh, I have a list of questions here. Yes. Just, we, we do not want to delay it any further because it's already half past 12. Just a quick question. Uh, uh, I think uh, there is a question from Ella. Uh, please, can you focus? Uh, I mean, what kind of support are you providing for supported living care as well, as well as for care homes? So many people living in supported livings are also vulnerable. So. Uh, Question at local authorities, Isaac. Yeah. Um, I can't I can't say for West Sussex or East Sussex, but I'm sure that we're probably in a similar position. So it's the same for Brian Hope. We are giving PP support and a whole range of support and testing support for those support workers who work in supported accommodation or floated accommodation as anywhere else. To give you an example, we have now taken all our rough sleepers, have are off the streets or have got offers of accommodation. We've got a small number. Who are, who are persistent rough sleepers who are still rough sleeping. But obviously in looking at them, we accommodate them in three ways. We've been accommodated as they're symptomatic or they're high, asymptomatic but low risk or asymptomatic high risk. And the people that are supporting communities as with the Ireland the supported accommodation blocks such as hostels are all receiving similar support and access to PP as our, as our other care workers. Okay, thank you Rob. And there's another question from Natalie. Uh, asking 
uh, will there be any scope for care homes to get a reimbursement for the extra monies they paid on uh, PPEs and other items in relation to spending regarding COVID? So that would be a question directed to local authority or CCG. Yeah, so silence. Um, to be honest with you, Isaac, I don't want to say anything that's going to come that I'm going to have held against me at some point in the future. I mean, obviously, the, everyone's having significant additional expense. So part of me, you know, says at the moment, I think the local authorities are picking up the tab at the moment for the PP for these national drops. Um, obviously, the, the care home providers are picking up tab if they're getting it through their procurement sources. There's going to, have to be something at some point we're going to have to look at really pulling together exactly what this has generally cost us. There were messages earlier on about should we still be buying from PP from, from providers who are trying to really um, just just you know almost extortion in the prices I gather they're, they're charging. Is that is that right or not? I think there are questions that need to be dealt with. I just say at the current time we're still trying to get ourselves prepared for dealing with the crisis and supporting staff and the and the market. There'll be a time whereby we need to address those issues, and that's not far away. But I've not, I've not personally got a, a got a, a firm position on that at the current time. Isaac, can I ask a, a West Sussex? And I would like to say something if that's possible. As a care yeah. manager myself, and this is something that was raised by you, Tom Jamison, and my question also to Rob Percy, um, with regard to PPE in Brighton care homes. Um, I know somebody was asking how many cases are there in Brighton. We know that last week there were five and at the end of last week there were six because one of the care homes that have got a confirmed case is one of my colleagues in my organisation. So one confirmed death and 80% of the residents showing symptoms. Now, what help can we get for the homes that have already got confirmed cases with regard to PPE because this home is currently only have masks, gloves, and aprons and yesterday the martlets gave them um, seven visors and none of the carers are working with the long sleeve gowns that you see people are using in hospitals. Now my colleagues are terrified, the staff are terrified, my staff are terrified and I'm terrified. Should we have a case like this in our care homes, how can we have to work without the same PPE that the hospital staff are using. Perhaps somebody can answer this first. Um, I don't know whether Tim Loughton, would you be able to come back in on that one? I'm, I'm, <laughs> I, I'm not qualified to give any further answer on uh, that. All I can say is that the focus of PPA, PPE going out now is to care homes um, and, uh, and, and carers. Um, I, I entirely hear what Azar's saying, and that's been echoed by various other care home providers. But um, there, there will be further drops this this week, as I say. How much that's going to fill the gap, um, I don't know. But the point is well known. Tim, I think I think the drops that are being made are still going to be the same waterproof surgical masks and and. May, maybe or maybe not the, the the flimsy aprons and rubber gloves. I think Azar's point was that that uh, that doesn't really feel very sufficient um, when we're bombarded with the media images of hospital staff in 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 far greater levels of PPE. And and I appreciate you can't answer the question at the moment, but um, again, if you can use your position to feed that back, uh, I think that would be very much appreciated. Sure. And, and the, I think there have been two reconfigurations of PPE requirements, and those should apply not only to hospital staff, but also to care setting staff as, uh, as well. So those tables, which and I saw a copy again last, uh, last night, about the levels of PPE uh, equipment and where it's appropriate, apply to all those care settings um, as well. If, if you're saying that the type of PPE you are getting doesn't fit that criteria, then that's certainly something that needs to be uh, um, fed uh, fed back. And I'm uh, absolutely happy to take that. Again, if people want to give me some and uh, some examples of what they're getting and where it falls short, then we can pass that um, pass that on. But ultimately, it's a case for the local authority commissioners 
to um, see where this stuff is going and whether it's the appropriate stuff as, uh, as well. And as I said at the beginning, they are taking a much more active role now on scrutinising PPE supply and trying to track where it's going and where it's being used. Okay, thank you. Um, and apologies, I've got the answer about it. There would be, though, no. Excuse me, I think surely there would be a difference between the care homes that do not have any confirmed case, um, because all these care homes should have the standard minimum PPE, but the moment a care home have a confirmed case and nothing additional, long sleeve gowns and visors should be made sure. immediately available to protect the rest of the staff who are coming to work still, otherwise staff are just going to walk out. Sure. Okay, I take, I, I've got that point. Yeah. Um, I, I'd like to ask one question to um, uh, Debbie Young, I think probably Debbie, um, about funding for West Sussex care homes. So a letter came out um, uh, a couple of weeks ago telling us that care homes are going to get a 0% up for the current financial year, whilst domiciliary care was getting an up to 4%. Um, and then with the coronavirus um, impact, uh, another letter came out saying that domiciliary care would get a 20% uplift for weeks, while care homes again were getting a zero uplift. And I just wondered if you could explain why the massive differential between your perception of the difficulties that care homes are facing and domiciliary care. Okay, so first of all, my answer will need to be brief because I um, needed another meeting, so I can only apologise. So in relation to the fees paper, that very much follows our commissioning intentions, so is independent of COVID-19. And I think the actual paper was quite clear on that, that um, COVID-19 arrangements are being made separately of that. So that's the first but what thing. are your commissioning intentions that, that with a 0% uplift uh, in fees face, whilst we face a 6.2% uplift in minimum wage? Okay, so first of all, um, what I can say is our commission intentions are focusing on um, community-based support in the first instance, so people being supported at home for longer, um, dementia care and nursing care. So we only have available um, a single pot of money and we have to use that money in the best way we possibly can. And we do appreciate that obviously that our decisions um, are not always liked. Um, what we can say is that last year and the year before, we have given increases where other local authorities haven't. Um, I, you know, so that's the only response I can give on that one. In relation to the COVID-19 payments, um, I think it's fair to say what we've put out so far is um, what we um, believed was um, right at that time. So um, as, as you say, we have um, said that we're gonna pay on planned um, for domiciliary care, um, also as a payment of 20% to domiciliary care. For now, we have made an offer of a payment of two weeks to residential and nursing providers. What we also said in that letter is that we would keep the, um, this under review, both in line with um, local challenge, I think, but also in line with any government um, directives which were actually given to councils. So that may not be um, our final offer, but that's what's in position now. I think it's fair to say that like, this is likely to be reviewed though, Tom, in light of what you have said. So uh, as I said earlier on the call, our intention is never to um, put providers in a deficit position, um, but equally I think as, as being recognised on this call, yes, there may be additional funding for local authorities, but that money um, is actually going to be far exceeded. So we still have to deliver a balanced budget and this isn't to make it a soft story for local authorities, but we, from a legal position, we have to deliver a balanced budget each year. So um, it's not that I don't understand or, can't hear, or don't hear what you're saying, um, but this is the position we're currently in. But as I said, in relation to the COVID-19 payments, um, I believe there may be, there has certainly been a level of challenge. So it's likely that's something that will be um, reviewed and as officers of the council we're likely to be um, uh, 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 asked to actually review that position that's all I can say at the moment. So does does the council have more residential care beds than it needs in the county at the moment? So as I said our cabinet decision paper is independent of the COVID-19 arrangements so I don't really want to detract from this call which I think is really about COVID-19 <laughs> and I'm not saying this just because you're asking me a question, but I am 10 minutes late for another meeting, which I need to attend. So um, I'm really sorry. So um, certainly we can pick this up outside of this meeting if you would like. And certainly I'm more than happy to do that. 
Well, I will just say that, that um, uh, as, as a provider of both residential and domiciliary care, I, I, I think it's grossly unfair that, that, that care homes have been given a zero uplift in, in either the commissioning or the coronavirus context. Um, uh, and and uh, just to say on behalf of all West Sussex providers, we will be communicating constantly. We have already been trying to communicate with the county council with very little response. Rosemary, would you want to just chip in there? Exactly what I was going to say. I cannot engage with anybody from Amanda Jupp to Catherine Galvin to the new DAS. So I, I'm at a loss to know what to do other than to take this further, which is what I said in the letter. Um, there can be no rationale to give Dom Care 20% under these circumstances and residential care none when actually most of the problems that we're facing are in residential care be it from the shopping trying to get shopping deliveries trying to get cleaning equipment trying to get ppes trying to 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 staff the care home trying to pay a uh, statutory sick people you cannot give dom care 20 percent and residential care none when we know and having listened to Lang and Busson yesterday most of the problems are in the care home and, I, and trying to engage with anybody anybody at all who would even answer my email means that I have no option but to take this further which is really not what I want to do Debbie but I, I don't think I have any options. So can I just check Rosemary have those emails been acknowledged by either Amanda or Catherine? No, but I know that they have because I've sent them from both my personal and I've sent them from the chair at and Amanda always answers my emails. So I'm not sure why suddenly they wouldn't be answered. Okay, yeah, so just, I shall so take that yeah, back just, uh, with me. Sorry? Oh, I've lost you. So I will certainly take that back and feed back um, following because the meeting. Because we gave a half past 12 deadline, Debbie, that if we haven't heard anything, to at least understand the rationale which, between dom care and residential care when everybody knows, and you'll have listened today, that the problems are in care homes. I'm not saying dom care doesn't have problems, they have different problems, but uh, most of the COVIDs are in care homes, most of the issues regarding shop trying to access food, PPEs, cleaning equipment, sprays or in care homes. I cannot, I cannot get my head round the fact that nobody's even answered my emails. And Tim has written and Tom has written and I don't think they've had acknowledgements either. Isaac. Okay, I will take that back, Rosemary. Can, okay. can I just add for East Sussex and Brighton and Hove that we're in communication with both local authorities over these exact same issues. All local authorities have received the letter from ADAS and the LGA, which details what this money should be spent on. And it does cover a wide sort of number of areas, but it's a significant amount of money for a three month period. And I think more will probably follow for, um, you, know, you know, once this is sort of sorted out. So the, the position where nothing is passed on to providers is just grossly, grossly inadequate, and unfair, and, and something that all providers should be should be very, very angry about. And, and that's a position that's going to be escalated, obviously, um, over the next few days. And it, it's taken too long for these decisions to be made when providers need this help now. So, it, if you can be assured that your care associations are taking this up very forcefully um, at the highest levels, um, and will continue to do so. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Well, we... thank you. I do need to leave the call now, but I will certainly take that back. So thank you to um, Tom and Rosemary. Thanks, Debbie. Thank you. Okay, cheers. Bye. Well, thank you, Tom. Are we done with the questions? Or? Well, there's, there's probably a lot more questions in the Zoom group chat, but uh, we are quite well over time now, aren't we? And I think I'm, I'm glad that last point made, but um, uh, perhaps we can um, Isaac, will you, will you be able to make a recording, a, a, a copy of this recording available to people who weren't able to attend? Yeah, sure. I can post it in YouTube. Uh, and, and maybe we could um, just pick out any of the questions that from the group chat haven't been answered and, and, and put a message out sure, I can do that. with yeah. them as well, can't we? I just wanted to add a few, few more things. With regards to food supply, I know many care homes in our county is actually depending on uh, 
supermarkets like Tesco's and Sainsbury's. So if uh, our MP could uh, pursue some, uh, uh, some force there, uh, if they could deliver to the care home rather than the staff going out and doing the shopping by themselves, that's a huge risk bringing back to the care home. That would be great, uh, like Tesco's and Sainsbury's. Uh, the second one is, I think in other parts of the country, I have uh, noticed that there is a good practice of having a contingency management, crisis management team has been set up to support the care homes. So uh, I think the nursing homes may have the skill set to take care of the people who are really unwell in this kind of scenario. But I don't think the residential care homes has the skill set to manage this sort of deadly virus infection. I think. So some degree of support. I think if the staff in the hospital are do not have enough things to do, maybe it makes sense to transfer people to uh, to those hospital beds, or uh, they can come out and help support the residential care homes as well. So that 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 that's just a two points that I just want to make. Uh, about, uh, Sorry, it's Carlton. Sadly, I just wonder if I could just chip in very quickly on that because I saw it was a question that was raised about the ability for. Uh, residential care homes to provide nursing care where that becomes necessary and about the CQC distinction just to highlight that if if people do find themselves in that situation um, that would obviously uh, be a, a breach of their conditions of registration so they would need to um, make an application to CQC to vary those conditions of registration but the CQC guidance on the website does suggest um, that there is a fast track process for dealing with those applications and also indicates that um, unlike the normal situation, you might be able to, it does say may, so query what that means, but you, you may be able to actually treat the changes effective as soon as you make the application. So that would obviously need bottoming out with CQC, but just to flag that is a, a possibility there. Mm. Uh, Carl, what happens if we don't want to go that road? Oh, well, there's no, there's no obligation to do, to, to, to do that. Uh, and I appreciate, I appreciate the point you were making about um, getting, um, you, you know, additional nursing staff from the NHS to come and provide effectively community nursing care into the home. Um, my, my point was that in the event that a provider is able and, and, and wants to go down the route to providing nursing care, then there are some sort of registration niceties just to sort out as well, but there does look to be a, um, a more flexible arrangement than normal. Mm, thank you. Thank you, Carl. And uh, I mean, we, we have already run out of time and people already started dropping out. So uh, I hope uh, we have created some value in organizing this. Uh, so if, uh, if you feel like that, then we can arrange it again after two weeks to discuss the issues and work collaboratively to uh, make things better for the people you are looking after and also the staff as well. So thank you very much for coming over. Keep safe. Thanks very much, Isaac. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Isaac. I think it'd be really helpful to continue these Zoom meetings. Thank you. Thanks, Thank Isaac. Thank you, Rosemary. Thank you. Thanks, Isaac. Thank you. Speak Bye, soon, Mike. Keep we'll just keep everyone. battling on, we're won't we, line. really? <laughs> it's a bit of a battle. On top of everything else, it's a battle. Anyway, we won't give up yet. We are strong. We will carry on. Social care continues. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah you're so... Yes, Debbie, you're so What right. day is it? <laughs> I've got no idea. I'm just pleased Saturday and Sunday we don't get quite so many emails. <laughs> anyway, speak soon. Take care. Bye, everyone. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Keep safe. Take care. You're coughing, Rosemary. I know, but it's not. It's nothing... Nothing like that, I can assure you. <laughs> I'm always coughing. I'm always coughing. Testing, but I don't want to wait that long. You just send me the breakfast, you know. So, you sure? So, I mean, can you wait till two? Do you think?